Bhagavato Arahantur Samma Sambuddhasa Namurtasa Bhagavato Arahantur Samma Sambuddhasa Bhutang Tamang Sankang Namasami So this is the last evening uh, we have on this retreat and during this retreat uh, trying to uh, convey to you the way to practice so that, uh, that the real test is in uh, is when you go home and so therefore, it's uh, you have to you recognize that that you don't have such supportive conditions for calm and silence. But that doesn't make any difference, really, in the long run. It's just determining in your mind to use the situation you're in, uh, because this is what we have to do if we're going to use wisdom. We can't. Uh, wait around for all the conditions to be ideal, because life very seldom presents us with with that. And when they do, it's very, usually brief periods, long long enough to get us attached, and then the rest of our lives we keep looking for ideal things again. And we don't want to be like that. We don't want to to always try to you know complain about the world and and uh, want it to be other than what it is. Because the world is the way it is, it's because of ignorance, and, and you can see in your own experience of meditation how, how we create uh, endless complications and, and uh, problems about nothing, really. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we begin to understand what the problem is on, in the society, in the and the, the leaders of our countries and the people and, you know, we, we realize that it is a problem that we all share of oh, this avicca. Now, so we can be more compassionate, can't we, towards others, towards the uh, leaders of the country, toward the people that uh, take on responsibility for for governing and for teaching, for doing all the different things necessary to keep the society going, uh, for our own relatives and friends, uh, we can see that that uh, really they're just doing what they're conditioned to do. That very few people have had an opportunity or an insight into into their into a way of life in which they uh, can rise out of just the conditioning of their minds, the programming, the programs that have been instilled in their minds. You realize how difficult it is for us to just to transcend our own one's own conditioning, because it easily falls right back into it. <laughs> But the fact is that we can do it and that we have to make that de- kind of determination in our lives. Not a willful kind of conceited determination, I'm going to do it, but a, a mature, cool determination. Put our efforts, put our attention and our energies towards a more uh, honest and moral and uh, mindful 
use of wisdom in our lives. This we can do. What other people do, we, it's really none of our business. We can't really uh, make demands on others. Uh, and if we do, then we, and we aren't doing it ourselves, then it's, it's hypocrisy, isn't it? We can't do it. We certainly shouldn't expect anyone else to. So that the important thing is that uh, for us to do that, It is a time in where there, there is a great need for this kind of thing. People, we need to transcend, get out of our cultural conditioning. It's very essential to get beyond just the, the ethnic and cultural attitudes and prejudices and biases that we have. Because it's uh, now a time where uh, the human population on this planet needs to develop in a different way than it has been. It needs to develop a heart, a compassionate heart, and some wisdom rather than just um, being clever and bright and, and uh, destructive. As our Chief Seattle predicted in 1854, he predicted that the white men would suffer in their own uh, wastes, and it looks like that's what's happening <laughs> in that famous letter to the President of the United States in 1854, Chief Seattle was uh, was uh, commenting on the how you know the whole attitude of the of the European uh, settlers, pioneers in North America at that time were, was one of just taking over things, owning land and, and, uh, and uh, exploiting it and killing off the animals and doing all this, these kind of things which the uh, American Indians found very shocking. They didn't, they didn't feel, they didn't have a sense of, of ownership of land. Mm. You could buy or sell land and it's definitely our hang up reached the ultimate what, last year during the, uh, when the property values I think the, the, the grottiest house in Great Gadsden was worth a hundred thousand pounds <laughs> people get very upset about boundaries and and property and an inch here and an inch there I and mean, get Really, and wanting to murder somebody if you feel that they're taking an inch of your land away, and we are we suffer it we 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 have so many ailments now with uh, you know that say didn't really seem to be much of a problem twenty five years ago, and uh this the the suffering a suffocation. Uh, that we, we've created in just uh, destroying our own environment. The deforestation and so forth of the planet. All this is a, is are the signs of uh, that uh, the whole a whole new way of thinking, a way of understanding life has to change because. Uh, we, we come from a time where it's very much a very childish attitude of what I can get from myself, very selfish, selfishness. Me, mine, my group, and the rest I don't care about. However, throughout all this, there have been signs of universal, you know, universalist signs. That, that the human mind has the ability to perceive in very expansive ways, like, like Global Village now is quite an interesting one, isn't it? Where, where uh, I mean that that was thought would make would make no sense, say, 25 years ago. It talked about a global village, but now it seems a, a thing that one can consider as a, as a way of thinking. Uh, we 
we can change our perceptions. We can be very narrow-minded, thinking of only me and what I, what I like or my group. But we can also expand with perceptions to the to that fullest, like the the all sentient being, the seen and unseen, like in the Karenia Meta Sutta. They they take that to the as far as you can get, including every possible kind of being that there could ever be in the universal system, to the most insignificant little little parasite or bug. So the mind, this is, this is how say, the mind, we can reflect on this, uh, the right of all beings to live. Uh, we don't. We can. We can contemplate the right of an ant, an ant's right to live its life. That's a reflection, isn't it? Uh, as far as as uh, reactions go, if it's in the way, kill it, isn't it? That's the immediate reaction. Get it out of the way. It's not, it, it's not doing me any good. It annoys me. Uh, nasty little creature. Kill it. And that's the that's the most kind of instinctual reaction we have. If it annoys and it and it is of no use, get rid of it. But we can also uh, contemplate its right to uh, coexist. And that's that's a, a much finer attitude, isn't it? It's more gentle and and uh, more beautiful when when we contemplate. Uh, an ant's right to to live, uh, then something in us uh, is is much more beautiful and more worthy of praise than say if we were just say get me the aerosol spray spray. It. Remember uh, when when I was a child in Seattle. This was long after Chief Seattle. <laughs> We never met, <laughs> but he. <laughs> uh, he used to, I used to go out and pour salt on the slugs in the garden, and watch them melt. <laughs> it's gruesome now. I mean, the idea that slugs uh, were a nuisance—they were, you know, if you're thinking in those terms. But no, it could be certainly unattractive and not lovable in any. Way, and uh, but and so one th- the felt just the immediate reaction was to to kill them. If you pour salt on them, they just kind of melt in front of you. And, and you what, pour the salt on, then they kind of do the <coughs> melting thing. And <laughs> <coughs> these were uh, kind of common. I mean, it, this was considered normal behavior. But as a Buddhist monk. Uh, we're forbidden. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I have to contemplate the slug's right to coexist with me, which is a m- much more beautiful uh, way of thinking. At least I, I feel it. If more people would think like this, there would we would there would be an end to the violence, isn't there? wouldn't there be? It's amazing how I mean you read about the things that are going on in the in the world at this time, and it's horrendous, absolutely horrendous, the brutality of people, just just uh, the most brutal murders taking place right now in some places on this planet, and and it is, uh, you know, human beings killing each other, not killing slugs. That's probably going on too. But if we if we contemplate this, then we 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 feel we begin to see that there's room for everything, room for everyone, and we can make room. We can we can make room. We we need to treasure our creatures and respect them because they are quite wonderful things in their own right. Even insects, in which we tend to dismiss as nuisances, pests, are quite miraculous little creatures. When you when you study them, when you 
watch them and try to understand their lives. One doesn't feel, one doesn't despise them, but one, one can wonder at them. Now the human being has the greatest potential because we have, we have the Buddha, Dhamma Sangha as our refuge. Rather than suffering in our own wastes, I suggest that we uh, change our attitudes and and uh, take refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha or in learning to understand our own existence and and learning to understand how why why the world is the way it is and how we can affect it in a good way for its welfare. Now we can see in just the, the example of, of the Lord Buddha how just one enlightened human being affected, uh, is affecting us. Now, from an ancient time in India, uh, yet his teaching and his, his, the Sangha that he established, the whole structure, the whole thing is still a function, still operates and works e- even in a country like this one. It's not, it's not, a, it was a, just through the wisdom and compassion of one human being, it has benefited us. You know, and, we, and so many people are willing to write Buddhism off as an archaic religion. You, say, it was, you know, it was, it was right for India 2,500 years ago, but it doesn't have anything to offer modern Europeans. When people talk like this, they don't under, they, they never because they don't know anything about Buddhism. They just assume that that's the way it is because it is an ancient religion. But it was established on universal principles, universal truth. So, it, universal truth is timeless, isn't it? It isn't. It isn't about antiquity and and ancient times and modern times. And we when we when we recollect the Dhamma, we realize it's timeless, it's about, it's a timeless teaching, not about, not a, an old uh, kind of, we're not anthropologists or archaeologists studying old Indian religions. I mean, we're here to, <laughs> to uh, work on ourselves, to get it right in our own minds, not just because we happen to we have maybe have a fascination for a- antiquity. Now, when when you go home, I mean, really uh, try to to bring make your try to bring into your consciousness the situation you're in, not as a criticism, but just as a reflection, this is the way it is. The place you live in, the people you live with, the place you work, the environment that you're living in. Bring it in, kind of affirm it in your consciousness. This is the way it is. It's this way. So that uh, that the, uh, you, you've, you've accepted it. You're not, you're not just kind of taking it for granted. And think you know it because you, you're used to it and it's your home and, and all that. Because the most the places we're most heedless is in our homes, and the, where we tend to really fall apart and get lost is is not not usually in the underground or the office. It's usually in the bedroom, <laughs> in the security of our own home, where we where we said that we can just fall apart and be totally heedless, caught up in all kinds of fears and desires. Because what's, what is, uh, uh, what we're used to, what we're accustomed to, and, and that is, is what we tend to know the least, because it becomes habitual. The people we live with, we think we might know, because we're just used to them. We think we, we just get used to each other. So uh, sometimes we don't know really the people we're even living with very well. We think we do. 
You see this in marriages. Shocking to see um, you know, people just think they know each other and they, they don't. I mean, they've been living together for years because they've just gotten used to each other. They become habits to each other. <laughs> this is easy to do uh, if you don't know how to do anything else. But we can, we, this is where we, can, we become a habit to ourselves. We don't know ourselves usually. Look how to really investigate and, and observe yourself, like on this retreat. It's hard work, isn't it? It really takes uh, determination and, uh, and a brave heart and, uh, and real uh, uh, fortitude to, uh, to sit there and just be with yourself in silence for hours on end. Not many people can do that. So you are all very special people. (laughs) Because you can do that. You can actually sit here for two weeks and and, uh, endure through a lot of very unpleasant mental states and physical pain. Well, so that's that's hard. Most human beings, are just, you know, this would be uh, like a a sentence, a prison sentence to most people coming in here for two weeks, sitting like this. <laughs> You'd probably rather go to a prison. <laughs> At least you can have TV lounges in prison. <laughs> but in uh, but and. So you can see so much of one's restlessness and anxieties just in the c- continuous efforts we make to distract ourselves. How we just, you know, always looking for something to do and distract ourselves. How restless and insecure we feel when we don't have the, our things around us, the things we depend on, and the, and we can't just ride in the force of habit where we're confronted with have to live without things that we we feel we have to have or how to to look at at various negative states and despair and fears and um that we're experiencing but one thing you have is, is having the refuges and the precepts the whole form a traditional form to follow gives a a very is gives us the support it's a psychological support for you, because you can actually, you know, there's there's some sense of purpose and meaning to it, and and we're not here, and not here to try to, for you to analyze yourself and and make judgments about yourself as being good, bad, mature, immature, or whatever. I've never said anything about that, have I? Now I would encourage you in any way to criticize yourself and make judgments about your state in qualitative terms. That's exactly what I don't want you to do. But I, I encourage just the reflection on the way it is. It's like this. So that the, that the, the uh, reflective mind is not judging. You're not, you're not saying, I am this way or this is my problem. Uh, the, this, this type of thinking is, uh, is to be you know, is not to be uh, encouraged to 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 create more identities with the conditions of your body and mind. That's not the way out of suffering. But to recognize a condition as a condition, because then in that moment of, even though you might not real, you know, it, it takes a while to for it to really sink in and to come through to you. But how that that you the in any of these conditions are really not yours. The good ones, the bad ones, the weak ones, the strong ones, all of these. They are what they are. And more and more you you find a centered, intelligent, mature way of looking at things. It's a transcendent knowing that's not conditioned by your experience of life, by your society or civilization or culture. It's universal. 
It's where we we're one in that perfect wisdom. We're one. We're not we're not many. On the condition level, we're all different, aren't we? We're all separate. I'm here, you're there. And I think like this and feel like this and my emotions and my, they're all this way and that way and nobody's going to have exactly the same feelings, same thoughts, same attitudes uh, as anyone else. This is we, with uh, so many billion people on the planet, no, no two people really look completely alike, do they? Amazing how the infinite variety of of creatures like the human beings, you know, with two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, two ears, a head, and things, how we manage to always, <laughs> you know, nobody really looks like anyone else. We have a unique appearance. <laughs> and so, uh, well, on this level, we're always going to be. Uh, the differences are, are that way. The differences are in the realm of of change, of impermanence, is this way. So it's infinitely variable, changeable. So that's not a refuge, is it? The realm of change is not a refuge for us, but the, the Dhamma is our refuge. In being able to uh, accept the moment the way it is doesn't mean we we like the way it is or we even approve of the way it is. But before, but the only this is for your reflection. The only thing we can do at this moment is accept it. It's like this. I don't want this moment to be like this. <laughs> Is very silly, isn't it? I want it to be something else, that, but this is the this moment can only be this way right now. This moment here and now, it's only possible for be it the way it is. Doesn't mean that we like the way it is at, in this moment, but it it is the way it is, and so we accept it. It's like in order to understand and to to be able to say, encourage change in skillful ways is to accept life rather than to to demand that life uh, fit your desires. So, even something we don't like, something that's wrong, we can accept it. And this acceptance allows us to see it. If you don't accept something, then you can't, you're just reacting to it. You can't, you're, ju- you're just following an emotional reaction so you can't really see it. You don't. Un- you can't understand it. Like a disease, isn't it? If you, if you just react to a disease you have, all you're going to do is suffer from it. I don't want it to get rid of it. So, you you just react and create negative states towards it, which does not help you the curing of the disease, does it? It doesn't. The thing that that most helps the healing process is accepting the illnesses and positively looking at them, trying to understand what it is. So if you have leprosy, you can you could react, I don't want leprosy. Nobody will love me anymore without my nose and my fingers. <laughs> They won't invite me to give retreats if I'm a leper. Venerable <laughs> <laughs> Bony Dander won't want to massage my feet anymore. And, uh, it might fall off in his hand. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a reaction to, to, uh, to, uh, to a disease. Or one can ac- accept the disease which isn't saying, I really love leprosy, so I've always wanted <laughs> it. Is, it is a way of, of accepting it and then doing the best you can with it, finding a cure. And if, 
and if there's no cure, whatever, one can live with the way it is without creating anguish and misery around the actual discomfort or uh, pain and unpleasantness of the disease. When my, my father was dying two years ago, I, uh, in fact, it was, he died two years ago today, August 19th. I wasn't there, but uh, during the last year of his life, he was bedridden, and I saw him uh, several, you know, in, in March of that year. And uh, in a nursing home, and uh, this was, he and I were never very close. One of those, uh, those uh, Anglo-Saxon families where, uh, I think English people are similar in many ways, where, you, where the, uh, where you, you're, very, you're on a very formal basis, always uh, how are you, son? And I'm fine, Dad. That's <laughs> about all we ever said to each other. <laughs> and, I have, and he was a very good father, actually, very good provider and and uh, caring in in ways that that one didn't realize. Uh, but as on a on an actual uh, level of uh, human warmth, there was. I don't remember it ever happening. It was very <laughs> formal. And and he was a, a a very moral person, very very good and moral and kind person. But he was a complainer of the worst order. He was he he complained endlessly because he he thought he thought everybody else was doing it all wrong. So. Uh, he would grumble and complain, and as he as he became increasingly uh, restricted in moving, he had terrible arthritis in his legs, and and could hardly walk, and couldn't you know without incredible pain, and that that he uh, he just complained and grumbled. So uh, they, my mother would have to uh, hire housekeepers to come in and clean and do things because she was getting too old to do that. So they. All the housekeepers would leave within a week or so, because <laughs> my father would would scold them and nag them and make their lives miserable. So, <laughs> and my sister, uh, my sister was always, she, you know, I could be a monk all these years and live far away, but my sister had to live right very close to them, and uh, and my father's always at my sister, and my sister is quite strong character, but it did wear her down at moments, and she got the kind of break down in despair. But I thought, and then as he was bedridden, he was so, he was a proud, you know, man, so he didn't like, like all these nurses having to uh, bathe him and, and uh, use the bedpan, and he lost control, is incontinent, and all the humiliating things that happen to you when you get old, he found just a horrible uh, an embarrassment for him. And so he, he tended to get very negative, increase the negativity. Contemplating this, I began to see how, how that, that actually nobody minds cleaning up a mess or the excretions of the human body. We can get used to all that and to to uh, those things are, 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 you know, we d- maybe don't, you know, really love to do that, but that's all right. We can, we can bear that. But what is very difficult for people to bear is ne- somebody's negativity. But that's what was really hard on my sister and my mother, it was, and the housekeepers and the nurses was that that they uh, they uh, they had to endure an endless kind of complaining uh, and bitter attitudes? And I thought, when I, as I'm getting older, and someday I'll be like that. I'll be probably, 
in you know bedridden and incontinent and all that and and that's in that's one thing you know none of us want to be i want when i i hope i die you know with all my faculties and control of my bowels and everything <laughs> <laughs> And die in a very clean and nice, inspiring way for people. <laughs> it's what I'd like, but it very likely could be the other way too. So then I thought, well, at least you know, it, if if I do become bedridden like that, at least I can, I can be, uh, you know, I can be a cheerful being and uh, grateful and uh, encouraging to people because then people would like to come around, wouldn't they? In fact, it's an excuse to bring you the bad pan a chance to... (laughs) 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 Well, if you're just a negative old grump, they they may do it out of duty, you know, here they come with the bad pan because it's their duty, but... You're not making it pleasant for them. You're not. You're making it totally unpleasant in every way. Now this is to consider how how good-heartedness and and as we as we accept the way life is for us, accept this as is, then then uh, we can respond to it in a in a more beautiful and and uh, positive way. Like the society we live in here in Britain, say how with so so much negativity in this country, so much criticism, people complain a lot, and uh, you know they they uh, it's uh, well, you know there's always something wrong with any country. There's always you know it's not as good as it should be, and I, and and one can say that about any place. In any country, I've never seen any country that one could say was perfect. Most of them uh, have so many things wrong with them. You can just, you know, spend all the time fault finding with any country in the world. So I think, like Britain has enough critics, there's enough of that. But what we need in order to help uh, to be a say, bring in what is a benefit and of use to this country that we live in is to respond to it more positively, how to live in it honestly and morally, how to uh, encourage that which is very good, how to praise those qualities, those institutions that are good, and to be able to forgive and not not blame and... and, uh, uh, feel and, and dwell in bitterness and negativity towards the things that the country does wrong. doesn't mean that we're becoming goody-goodies and we, we don't see the wrong, but there's a difference between recognizing what's wrong and indulging in negativity about it. One can see what's wrong, but one needn't you know, endlessly make a big thing of it and, and dwell on it and may and uh, keep and bringing it up with other people so that that uh, we begin to develop a, a jaundiced view or a negative attitude towards the the country that we live in uh, this is one way of say learning how to accept the country the way it is, with all its good points and bad points. So we accept, say, Britain the way it is. It's this way. We're not, we're, it's not a, a judgment as in one way or another. It's this way. And then we can become more aware of its good qualities without becoming patriotic and nationalistic. <laughs> And we can become aware of its faults, and we, then we're more aware of what we can do to, say, encourage the good, and and encourage what is skillful in this country. Not by blaming it for having faults, but by encouraging it, and living our own lives in a way 
that is of benefit to the country we live in. Not many people think like this anymore. It's in uh, in the United States, there was we were brought up to just endlessly demand things. We have our rights, and we want this, we want that. You have to give me this, you have to give me that. And if you don't give it to me, I hate you for it. I resent it. I pay my taxes, I have my rights there. <laughs> so we, we, we know very seldom have we ever thought about duties and ways of, of living within the country for, to benefit it, to help. So this is important because we have to live in some place or another and, and Britain is a very nice country to live in. It's, a, it's a, one of the nicer countries as far as I'm concerned. It's certainly a country that I enjoy living in. And so it is, uh, it has, uh, it's, it's, you know, as far as What's wrong with it is in those uh, that, that can be recognized, but it still doesn't doesn't change the fact that that uh, one's presence in this country is 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 going to benefit it through uh, thinking about more positively about it and living in a way that is not exploiting it, misusing it, taking advantage of it taking it for granted. A country like this is very easy to take for granted, isn't it? A welfare system. and I'm not against welfare systems. You might think I am, but I'm not. I think, I think they're very humane. <laughs> and I think uh, uh, this country is, is very, very humane in that way. It's, it's national health. is probably the most generous health system in the world. Well, in America, it's dreadful. In the United States, it's the most horrendous health system. And uh, we're here, uh, even uh, foreigners can get right on the national health within a week. So, I mean, it's a very generous system. One appreciates that. One, one respects that, that it does try to look after its citizens. But the problem with, with, with uh, when, when things are laid on for you too much, sometimes you, you take it all for granted. That we, can just, we can just take this country for granted. We can, we can survive, live, live on the dole, and and uh, just uh, get by on just taking advantage of the welfare system of this country. Well, this is not a this is not a a way of say that is go of going to be a benefit to you or to the society. Is that, that attitude of just exploiting or taking advantage of the system? So we 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 try to rise above that. Try to live in a way in which we 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 are adding or helping or, or uh, doing that which is, is going to be a benefit to the society we live in. One, one very important way is, is morality. Being scrupulously honest and moral, what we do and say, is a great benefit to, to the society, to ourselves and to the society. I think Britain has the most more charities than any other <laughs> country in the world. Uh, charities for everything, for lost dogs and... <laughs> hedgehogs and whatnot. <laughs> But 
That doesn't mean it's perfect, because one can still, no doubt many of you uh, know all kinds of things about the the lack of humanity or the things wrong, but there's that too, and no doubt things that are very much wrong and and can be improved, but recognize generally it it's a it's a, a welfare system, dem, a democratic system, and it, and it tries. But, but we have to recognize that it's run by people. But I assume it doesn't seem likely that any of them have ever had that realization. So uh, it's it's uh, it's quite one thing is impressive is it's as, as good as it is. But we we can make it better, can't we? One thing we can make we by our own insight and right attitudes and understandings and our own. Uh, impeccable conduct in this country is going to definitely be a benefit, mainly to oneself, but also very much for the society. And more and more, as, as we take on responsibility for our lives within this country and live in the right way, that will affect the people around us. So you, you'll break through this kind of apath- apathy and kind of attitude of just drifting along in a system and the government owes me this, and it's got to do and my rights, and it's got to do this and that for me. That will, will that way of thinking will seem very foolish and selfish and immature, as as more people take on the responsibility for their lives and don't make endless demands on the system. We, we think the the government. I think we've all given up hoping that the next government's going to solve everything solve all the problems, isn't it? There used to be this kind of mystique that that all the problems we have now are due to the government, present government, we'll elect a new one, and then they'll solve all the problems and we'll live happily ever after. But I've never seen that. In the United States, I remember we had... Uh, my parents were devotees of President Roosevelt, a child. They absolutely adored Roosevelt. And then... And I had a, I when I was about ten, I had I was, I was delivering newspapers. I had to gather these newspapers at a petrol station, and people that around the petrol station hated Roosevelt. So they told me all the most horrible stories about President Roosevelt. So I'd go home and tell my mother and father, and they'd say, "Oh." <laughs> They hated President Hoover, who was before Roosevelt, and blamed him for everything that was wrong. And it goes on like this, and then, they, then each election there used to be this hope that everything would get better and better. And, and this, this idea that politics, somehow politics was, going, was really important, political systems and economics and things that are really what it, life is all about, getting it right on the political and economic scene. And that's going to be, that's where it's at. That's going to make us happy. But that obviously is not what makes us happy. And even, even if it's a benevolent and adequate political system and economic system, it's in the, in the heart, isn't it? That's where we find adequation. Not in not in a political system or a government, with all the the democratic ideals and and institutions that our countries have, the reason why they 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 don't work as well as they could is because we don't elect people into those offices who have understood the four noble truths. <laughs> so. The more people that begin to realize, have insight into these four noble truths, and four, three aspects and twelve stages, <laughs> the more chance that our democratic systems are really going to be a much better, more efficient, more uh, compassionate than they are now. But until that, I wouldn't expect too much. <laughs> Uh, 
Now, people sometimes say, well, you know, the, the, the social activists who think we should go out and try to help the society, and then there are those who think we should get it right in ourselves first, we should meditate, get enlightened, then go out and help the society. And so there's, this is how, there's, a few years ago, there's this, this was the big thing in the Buddhist world of Britain, with engaged Buddhism versus meditation. Those who sit in a vipassana retreat looking at their breath and those that go out into the society and protest against nuclear weapons and which is the best. And this is, and of course, when, you know, people have preferences, obviously, otherwise it wouldn't have been a, an issue. But, uh, really, I don't see any problem there. It's not a, not a matter of that you do one and don't do the other. It's, uh, it, and I, I went to some of these seminars and all that, and, and, and I think that it kind of fizzled out after a while because it became apparent that it was really not an issue. It was a non-problem. Because it, there, there, it's not a matter of uh, one isn't going to spend all one's life out with protesting against nuclear weapons. And uh, now, they, you know, that's not a real problem anymore, is it? At least not in the way it was before. And, and then uh, the, uh, the necessity of, of uh, developing your own practice. Now we need to to recognize our our own limits and uh, and what we can do and what we we're, we're good at what 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 we can actually do that it will be a benefit to be caught up in wanting to do everything and or or have you know big ideas of saving the world this I would avoid this is really. Uh, very necessary to understand the limitations that we have as individual creatures. And to get it right within our minds then allows us to uh, do what we can for the society and the world. It's not, I've never, it does seem totally impossible to me that meditation, if done rightly, is going to Make you so that you can't or you can't do anything for the society. Doesn't uh, even if you're even if you're uh, uh, crippled and can't can't you know and you have to be taken care of by others. There's still a lot one can do, isn't it? One thing, being wise and being kind and being grateful and all these things. That, uh, bring joy into people's lives, the people that might have to take care of us. So I said before, if we're mindful and wise and compassionate, then even if the society has to seemingly take care of us, we can offer something back in our own joy and uh, wisdom to the people that are helping us, our patience, our gratitude. So even uh, even if we were restricted with paralysis and things like this, it's still it's still uh, uh, an attitude of mind which which is going to be ben- benefit others. So we can't really divorce ourselves from others. We can't look. That's uh, that just seems to be a. Uh, totally wrong assumption that somehow I am I am uh, separate from you that's the appearance that's how it looks through the eyes and how the perceptions in the mind are but we're all in this together our lives are bound up with each other and that Im- means with everyone in every every creature every human being on this planet we're all on the planet together we're all in the same boat. We're all on the same planet. And we all affect each other. And we can affect each other in negative ways or in positive ways. So that when we appreciate this in its 
in its uh, totality, then we, we realize that just by right thinking and right action, right conduct, right speech, that that is for the benefit of all beings. The more we refrain from acting and doing, living in, in ignorant and selfish ways, that is affecting everything. Look at it like that, that, that our, what we do is affecting everything. Everything I do and say isn't just, it's my business, mind your own business, I can do what I want. But I realize my life is, a, is, is intertwined with everyone else's. And therefore, when I, re, when I contemplate it like that, I, I, want, I realize I must take responsibility for it and learn how to, to live in a way that is a benefit. So this is the compassionate heart combined with wisdom in which we... we we uh, are no longer uh, holding on to a view that somehow I am a completely separate entity and I can live my life the way I want to. To To want to live my life the way I want to, I say, I do. I want to live my life the way I want to. The way I want to live it is so that it will be a benefit to others. That's my, that's my ideal, that, that this life, as long as this thing's breathing and functioning, and that, that it will be uh, of benefit to other beings, because I, uh, one feels a profound and deep unity with all other creatures, all other beings. To think in terms of, I want this for myself, that kind of thinking now is ugly to me. It doesn't mean I don't have those kind of thoughts. But I, those kind of thoughts are not the kind of thoughts I want to grasp and act on and believe in. And that those selfish attitudes and thoughts, uh, me and mine, and, and uh, uh, that those are now reflected in my mind as conditions not to act on, not to grasp, not to believe in. In a community like monastic community, more than you live in a, in a sangha, that sangha attitude, its uh, selfishness is so, so, it stands out like a sore thumb in a sangha. Any monk or nun or anagarika who's who's acting selfishly, stands out like a sore thumb. A really sore thumb. <laughs> so, yeah. Because the whole attitude of a sangha is a cooperative uh, whole and uh, the welfare of the sangha. So you find many, many of us, we've all had to let go of a lot of our selfishness and immaturity because it just looked so ugly in in context of sangha life in Thailand, uh, uh, living in the uh, in the monastery in Thailand, I because I was quite a selfish person, and um, and I was uh, you know this selfishness. Uh, that's one one thing I think with Ajahn Chah was such an effective teacher was that. Uh, he was so obviously unselfish that when you were around him, your selfishness looked just horrible. When you were with other selfish people, you, it doesn't seem so bad. Like, and if you're somebody who's more selfish than you, you could feel quite unselfish. <laughs> but, but when you were with Ajahn Chah, suddenly it all stood out. It's, Blazing, the, the alarms went off. And this, this is really ugly. And so, living with somebody like that for ten years is a, a, really a great honor because it was a, a continuous reflection uh, of my own immaturity and selfishness. Without him, kind of 
saying, oh, you're selfish, or, you know, it, that wasn't necessary. It didn't need, he didn't need to tell me. It was quite obvious, just living there and uh, living in a community where uh, everyone was trying not to be and where the, the teacher was a very uh, compassionate, unselfish human being. So that I'm very grateful for. It's that one, the selfishness is painful. It's a, it's a, it's a very painful thing to be. Very miserable to think of yourself all the time and to just be holding on to, to your own views and opinions and uh, and defending and justifying yourself. So these monasteries, these are like these Buddhist monasteries here in England. The more they develop and grow, and the monks and nuns uh, develop wisdom, then that will they're they're having good effect on the on the people on the people that contact them. And like Amravati now, more and more people come here, and uh, it has it's quite well known at Chithurst and the other viharas. Uh, because you can see people are very, you know, people, none of us want to live in a mean and selfish world. But we live in a society that encourages us to be selfish, doesn't it? We're, we're very much encouraged to to think of ourselves and to to get things for ourselves. And me first is is uh, is generally how we're we're conditioned, but it is painful. And even we live in a benevolent country and in, a, in an affluent country, the suffering is from this selfishness. So when you do go home, try to try to really, like, like really look at when you're feeling negative or notice, begin to just notice the negative reactions to things, or, or uh, and not not as a criticism, but just to be aware of it more, of how of of just feeling of being uh, uh, unhappy or disgruntled or or grumbling or complaining about things. Just note the feeling of it. And that's mindfulness. The more and more you, you're, you're not trying to become someone who doesn't complain, but you're actually noticing the effect of complaining. And by doing that, you are developing the Eightfold Path. If you live, if you keep the, the five moral precepts, and practice the, that's the Sila Foundation, the three refuges, the five precepts, then the, then the bhavana, uh, uh, the, the, pra- the development of the path, is don't, don't, the attitude of, say, from a retreat, is that you have to have this kind of situation to practice with. But change your attitude to practice wherever you are. The, the moment is here and now. And as you're aware of the now, wherever you are, that, that is enough. Trust in that. You're aware of your own feeling of negativity or complaining. Aware of it as, as it is. It's this way. It feels this way. And by this kind of reflection, we're, we're opening the heart to the way it is. Uh, to the confusion or the peace or whatever, the, whatever way it is now. And that is 
developing mindfulness. Be patient with it. And, 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 and as you, but if you're trying to get something out of it, then you'll feel discouraged because you can't, you can't keep it, you can't hold on to it. So you've got to allow for distraction and the force of habit. But more and more, take the opportunity to, to bring attention to the here and now moment, to the breath, to the sound of silence to the posture of the body, the reflection of this is the way it is, uh, wherever you are, in your homes or in your places you work, when the waiting in a queue or whatever, it's uh, to, to use your life more as a reflection will, will help enormously in wisdom, the kind of wisdom in which you will be able to they not create suffering around the way the world happens to be, or whatever ha- does happen. By doing this, then you have you have a much more, you have much more say integrated, and capable of responding to the challenges of your life in a way you you could never do if you are still operating from this fear and desire and and force of habit. Don't think in terms of practice in an idealistic way. Be very practical. It's here and now, so that uh, it's uh, it's not to be not uh, the more, more you want to hold on to an idea of practice, the more you feel frustrated by it. that you can't you can't keep you can't make life fit into your idea of practice. But life is like this. And it moves, it changes, it's, it's all over the place. When you say you go from a more kind of still and ordered situation uh, on a retreat to back to the, a busy world, that still needs to be an obstacle. If your attitude is one of acceptance and willing to practice with it, reflect on it, watch, be vigilant, learn from it, and, and the places you're most weak and most insecure, really look at those places. Look at the dukkha to understand it. 